Welcome to the Center for U.S. War Veterans Oral Histories at the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey in Seagirt, a partner of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Today is November 30th, 2015. I am Carol Fowler, Director of the Center. My honored veteran is William A. Wallace, who served in the United States Army in the Vietnam War. He served from September of 1969 until September of 1971 and was infantry, the 2nd Battalion of the 327th Regiment, 101st Airborne Division, Light Weapons Infantry, 81 millimeter mortars. That's true. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, I, Bill. I got a chance to see your museum. It's outstanding. Wow. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for wanting to be here today, Bill. Your eyewitness account is considered a primary historical source and a valuable contribution to the Veterans History Project here at the National Guard Militia Museum. Good morning and welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to know how did you hear about this project here? I heard about it through uh, a very uh, distinguished gentleman whose name is uh, Mr. Greg Parisi. He's a, a World War II veteran, uh, walks around with a plate in his head uh, as a result of a grenade that went off, killed several people he was serving with. Uh, the man is in his 80s, late 80s. Uh, he's a prime speaker uh, at all the events around this area. I think he's actually in charge of the uh, VFW in um, Asbury. The man is outstanding American. Very Greg distinguished. Parisi. Mr. Greg Parisi, Gregory Parisi. Oh, okay. And the reason I know him is because his son, Greg Parisi Jr., uh, worked with me on the Howe Township Police Department for many years. And as a matter of fact, his two sons are police officers currently in Asbury Park, New Jersey. So, uh, yeah, that's how I was aware of this particular program, through Mr. Parisi, who's a definitely distinguished war hero. I'm so, um, I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, I used to film there, the veterans there. Oh, is that right? Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so take me back to life prior to service. Anybody in your family served before you? Um, my grandfather was a police officer in uh, Nutley, New Jersey. My father was a lieutenant uh, in World War II. So there's a little military history there on, on, on the part of the family. And, uh, and then there's me. Tell me, about sister. I'm sorry. tell me about your father's service. Uh, I don't know too much about my father's service. Never discussed it too much, other than the fact that I could see his uh, uh, pictures, you know, albums, looking through the albums. Uh, when he was in the service, uh, seeing his, I think he had a chest that had, you know, Lieutenant William A. Wallace Jr. engraved on it and you know, stuff like that. Uh, I know that he was stationed, ironically, um, on, a, on, a fort, on a fort that was located in, um, I want to say, not the Philippines, in Puerto Rico. Uh, a lot of tourists have been there, I've been there myself. Oh, uh, if you okay. see, if, uh, it's a common place for people to go to Puerto Rico yes. to visit. Again, I've been there many times, and that fort there, we see the cannons going out over the water. That's where my father was stationed. So it was one of the better assignments, right. as opposed to uh, Mr. Parisi's assignment, uh, which was carrying much more danger. Okay, um, let's see. So you had been a student at the University of Tennessee. Yeah, go balls, uh, Peyton Manning. So uh, yeah, I was a student at the University of Tennessee in those days. Um, what were you studying? I was studying uh, personal management, you know, any type of business, uh, business degree. I actually started in accounting and uh, wound up in uh, like personal management, personnel management. Um, in those days, a lot of people were going to college primarily so they weren't drafted. Uh, this is just before the, um, the lottery system, uh, so I, I wasn't uh, subject to the lottery and I was in fact Actually, I wasn't really drafted. I was scheduled to be drafted on September 21st, 1969. Rather, right. than, rather than that, that happening, your... I enlisted. You see on my records there, it says RA, regular army. I Wait, enlisted. What, what, sorry, what's your date of birth? My date of birth is December 4th, 1946. Okay. So I was in Vietnam. I was, uh, what, 23, 24 years old. Okay. Well, how did you actually enter the service? I entered the service because I was going to be drafted. Oh, I got enlisted. a notice that I was going to be drafted on September 21st. No, excuse me. I was going to be drafted on September 22nd, 1969. Knowing that, I enlisted the day before on September 21st, 1969. That's how it happened. 
Um, December. I did that for a reason. September. Both were September. Okay. Yeah, and both dates were September. Why the army? Uh, my intent at that time, I was married then, and I was married at 19. So my only goal was to get into the service as quick as possible and get out as quick as possible. I had other opportunities, but they would have required more of a time, more of a commitment. And, uh, you know, 19 years old, or what, well, then I was 20, what, what, um, what was I there, 23. You know, that was my mindset. So in answer to your question, I knew that on September 22nd, I was going to go to Asbury. I think it's draft board 33. And there's going to be 33 people there three of whom were going to be drafted into the Marines. That's what I was told. To avoid being drafted by the Marines, I enlisted the day before to avoid that happening. Why? Well, at the time, I figured being a college graduate, I would be able okay. to get into the military, and I would get some sort of like easy desk job, supply, An typing. Officer. Yeah, who knows? Uh, Non-combat uh, type of uh, assignment. However, after I completed my uh, basic training in Fort Dix, New Jersey, and I saw my orders were now sending me to Fort Lewis, Washington, in the state of Washington, going to advanced infantry training, I realized quickly that that was not going to happen, which was fine. It worked out fine. So the whole time you're in college, you're married? Uh, I was married age 19. Not the whole time, but most of the time I was married, yes. Most so of the she time came with you to Tennessee? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my wife was with me at Tennessee. It's very unusual. And you finished? Yes. Yeah, I'm a graduate, graduate of the University of Tennessee and also fairly Dickinson. On the other end of the story, uh, I wound up being a police officer in Howe Township, New Jersey. While I was working for the Howe Township Police Department, I got a master's degree from Fairleigh Dickinson University. Wow. So, in what? Business as well? Um, public administration. Nice. Yeah, master's degree in public administration. So yeah, I had a nice career in police work. It worked oh, out. For me, it worked out quite well. I was fortunate. Mm -hmm. So you enlisted, and the first place you went was Fort Lewis? The first place I went was Fort Dix, New Jersey, for basic training. What kind of adjustment was that for you? Uh, that required a major adjustment because I came from a, a very pampered life. I live right, you see my mailing address is Seager, but it's actually Wall Township. So I live only maybe two, three minutes from right where we're at right now. Uh, my mother, who was the greatest person ever, uh, spoil, spoiled me really to death, almost to a disability. Um, I never heard that before. Oh yeah, my what mother was mean? my mother's amazing woman. Well, because she's trying to do so much for me that, in retrospect, uh, I'm uh, amazed that I could have accomplished anything in life. Um, because, like, in those days, there was no uh, remote controls, uh, but my mother was the remote control. So when I get up in the morning. My mother had, you know, three eggs, bacon, my clothes were ironed and ready for me to put on. My entire life, my mother spoiled me her entire life until the day she died. And uh, she was actually the most amazing person I've ever met in my life was my mother. Not too many people can say that, but yeah, very giving, kind person. Took care of a lot of people in addition to me, which is a whole other story. But in any case, yeah, I was really spoiled. And the only thing that really saved me is the fact that I was able to go to the University of Tennessee, have some time to be on my own, and uh, you know, uh, grow and develop a little more uh, on my own. Uh, yeah, it's just a fact. And then at Fort Dix as well, right? Well, Fort Dix, well, at the University of Tennessee, I also got involved in those days in martial arts. That was very helpful for me. Uh, the UT School of Karate was a big part of my life. Um, something I got involved with uh, maybe when I was, uh, what, maybe my first year at the University of Tennessee. So that was good and something I, you know, continue with. My boys are high-ranking black belts today in judo, jiu-jitsu, karate, boxing, you know, so that was my life. And, um, but, when I, when I, so now I'm at Fort Dix. Now I'm used to a very pampered life and I'm, now I'm standing out there freezing at parade rest, moving up in these little circles they had and you move from uh, circle to circle to circle, getting closer and closer to the mess hall. When you finally got into the mess hall, you would sit down. If you, they give you 10 minutes to eat, it was a long time. So this was another shock to me because I'm used to, even this to this day, uh, if I'm not eating with my friends, I'll be the last person to finish the meal because I was just used to it as a child. I take my time, eat my meal. Uh, in the military, that doesn't happen. 
And uh, yeah, it was quite a shock for me, okay. very much so, definitely. And taking care of your own clothes, I guess, too, right? Yeah, all of that stuff. My mother always washed my clothes, ironed my clothes. First time I ever did it in my life, all my stuff came out. I forget, blue or pink, it was a disaster. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but nevertheless, my mother must have done a reasonably good job because, I, you know, I did quite well. And, and all the things I did, I actually excelled as opposed to get by. But myself, my own mind, I'd be like thinking about it. So, oh, man, I'm lucky I could even get, you know, get by at all, truthfully. But, so when you got to boot camp or Fort Dix, uh, what were you good at? Um, well, I was, I was a, a pretty good athlete. Uh, they had different types of competition. They had, and first thing I think was the M6, well, no, it was the M14 competition. Mm -hmm. I was one of the top, I think it was the top three in the, in the battalion. I'm not sure about it, but I know the top three people got to go home. Now, this was a godsend to me because I was married. So I got to go home with two other people and everybody else stayed there. The following week they had M14, no, M16 competition. And again, I was in the top three, I got to go home. Mm -hmm. Um, then the following week, they had a physical fitness competition. Again, I was in the top three. I got to go home. Well, now it came to the fourth week when the entire, entire company was going to go home. But I don't know if you remember those days, but there was a lot of hippie protests going on. And the word was that there was going to be some sort of hippie protest somewhere. I can't remember where. And they were going to hold our unit and nobody was going to go home. Well, you know, I, I said, this is a bunch of crap. These people aren't doing anything. We're not going to do anything. And me and this other guy, I found out yesterday, looking through my notes, I, I told the story for years with a guy by the name of Tom Harding. Yesterday, I found out his real name was Wayne Harding. And Wayne had a grandmother that lived in Browns Mill, which is located next to Fort Dix. So we came up with this uh, uh, brilliant idea that we were going to go home, which we did. So I had this guy, Wayne Harding, drop me off at my parents' house here in Wall Township and with the intent of picking me up the next day or I forget, you know, maybe 20 hours later and we drive back to Fort Dix. Well, I did come home, I saw my wife and I'm waiting for the guy to come pick me up. You know, there was no cell phones in those days. I didn't have the guy's phone number for his house. He just never shows. So I wound up having my wife drive me in my 68 uh, Volkswagen I had at that time, back to Fort Dix. I, I melted into the formation, went through training the whole day. I never saw this guy, Harding, who we worked together with. Later that night, went through the training the whole day. That night, so, Drill Sergeant Kane called me into his uh, what, room at the barracks, and he said to me, Wallace, where were you last night? I know my mouth started open. I don't know what I was going to say at which time he told me to shut the F up and proceeded to tell me that Harding hit a deer on Route 70 after dropping me off at my house. He was now in the hospital. And I don't forget, I was doing pretty well. And uh, because of that, I mean, normally this would be immediate Article 15, I'd be in the stockade, no doubt about it. However, he could say, I mean, I had no intent of being AWOL in a typical sense of AWOL. My intent obviously was to come back and I did come back. Uh, it could have been a big problem for me, obviously, but he basically said to me, don't ever effing do that again. Get the hell out of my office. And that was probably the biggest break I ever got in the military right there that day. Very lucky, yeah. Uh, extremely lucky. Yeah, Because you didn't actually utter the words that you left. I never said anything. I never got a chance to say it. He did all the talking. I started to say something, and he stopped me. Uh, it worked out to be uh, fortunate. Now, it could have been another part of that story that I didn't tell you that helped me. When we first got there, everybody, including him, everybody was assigned to uh, some sort of Mickey Mouse detail. And I happened to be in the same room with him, just two of us, Sergeant Kane and me. And I had a talk, chance to talk to him like I'm talking to you. I didn't know he was going to be my drill instructor, and he didn't know I was, he was going to be my drill instructor. I talked to him for several hours that night. He knew my whole personal history. I knew his, and then we went on, and, oh. and he turned out to be my drill instructor. Now, then we never talked, ever, at that point, until that night, when he called me into the office and said what I just told you. Mm. So I think that helped me, mm. and the fact that I was doing very well helped me. And another thing that helped me, I, I forgot to mention, at the University of Tennessee, in those days, 
ROTC was mandatory oh. so that for all male students. So I didn't like it at the time, but I had to go in there, I had to march, I had to you know, put my uniform on, look sharp, polish my shoes, carry the uh, rifle, take the rifle apart, etc. Now when I went to basic training, you know, that put me a, a notch ahead of all the other uh, uh, recruits who didn't have that experience or that background. All right, then let me ask you, when you finished, why weren't you commissioned a second lieutenant? When I finished what? ROTC. No, no, no. I, I never went to ROTC. Oh, no, I see what you got. When, uh, when I say ROTC, I'm talking about college ROTC. That's mandatory for all students. They're not going into the military, these people, nor would I. I went in, I, this is mandatory. In other words, when you went to University of Tennessee in 1969, if you were a male student, you were mandated to go to ROTC classes and go through all the military stuff related to that. Now, that, there was no obligation to go do anything with the military, none whatsoever. I know you're confused because a lot of people yeah. that are involved with ROTC today and even high school are on a program. Oh, it's different then. Yeah, totally different. Yeah, the programs today, people, I, and I know friends that are doing that currently, uh, you know, ch fr friends of my children are doing that, where they join ROTC right in high school and... Junior ROTC, right. Yeah, and actually go from high school right into the military. Uh, one of my friends that I play, play billiards with, Brandon Masters, his son, Henry, is about to be deployed uh, in a month or two through that program. Not from college, from high school. I never heard of that. They, so junior ROTC, they don't go to college into ROTC? They can actually be deployed? Right yeah, in this case, school? yeah, yeah, apparently. I didn't hear it either, except for one of my friends is, is doing it. One of my friend's children, who's maybe 20, is doing that right now, currently. Yeah. So let's get back to Fort Lewis. You mentioned advanced infantry training? Uh, well, for, yeah, Fort Lewis, I went to advanced infantry training. So I knew now pretty much my fate was set. <laughs> I wasn't going to get any easy job, desk job, or that type of stuff. So that was fine. Out. Now I'm in. Once I'm in, I'm in. I'm all in. Uh, that training was very good. That was excellent training. Um, I had some of the worst days of my career actually at that base because when we went out into the field, Fort Lewis is the most worst place in the world to be in certain months, December, January. It, when I got there, they issued gear like you're going fishing. You now you see on TV, the people were, I'm like, what are they giving us for? What are they giving us gear for? Well, I found out in a hurry. Because if you check the weather there in Washington, the state of Washington, January, February, those years, it, it rains almost constantly. It's cold. It's damp. They have a heavy fog that like eats right through you. It's really, really bad. I think we had some guys die of uh, spinal meningitis. Uh, one morning I woke up. My bed was soaked. Soaked. I, took, I borrowed a thermometer from a guy. I took my own temperature. It was 103.6 or 7. I remember it to this day. I said, man, I'm not telling these people that I'm sick because they'll put me in the hospital, I'm due for a leave like in a day or two, oh. and they'll cancel it. So a good thing about the weather, the weather was freezing. So I was out trained, I trained all day in this freezing, freezing weather, and uh, I got to come home. The downside of that, right here in, New, New, in Wall Township, I came home, I was deadly sick. And the way I described to people, my friends, how sick I was, now I was young, I was married, and I was in good shape, but during that entire visit, I, there was no sexual relationship with my wife at all. That's how sick I was. I was deadly sick while I was on leave. I just barely sort of recovered when I went back to Fort Lewis, Washington. Yeah, that was, I probably almost did die then. And other guys did. Um, wow. Yeah, did so you go to the hospital? No. Yeah, I, I, I'm one that, uh, my mother's a very tough individual. Uh, reflecting back on her for a second, my mother passed away when she was 84. I thought she would outlive me. The healthiest person I ever knew was my mother. And, and that never complained about anything, ever. You, if she was sick, you would never know it. Um, so I get a lot of that, I think, from my mother. Uh, some of it's good, some of it's bad. I'm the type of person, if the average person would run to the hospital in 15 seconds, I might go a week later. This is not a good thing. But it's just part of my makeup. And, and this it was evidenced here at, at Fort, at Fort uh, Lewis, Washington. Because what happened, we went out for about five or so days into the uh, woods for training. It was bitter cold. Everybody had a sleeping blanket. I had a sleeping blanket. First day we slept there, everything was fine. 
Well, I had a sleeping bag blanket where the zipper was, was broken and you couldn't like secure it. Well, while we were training that day, the way, you know, the way it was raiding my blanket, to make a long story short, got soaked, soaking wet. Now, the first day we were allowed to have a fire with a big group there. So I took my blanket, I put it over top of this fire, and I thought it had dried out. You know, I waited, waited, everybody else was sleeping. I got my blanket there, I put it down, I jumped in there, getting nice and uh, cozy, and all of a sudden I felt that water come up through that blanket to like, you know, I was gonna get soaked, I had to, I had to get out of there. So, <laughs> I, there was, they had like latrines out there uh, that were like metal, like metal buildings. You could go in there and shield you from the wind and shield you from the rain. So I went in there, and of course the, the, the smell was horrific, but I started, I would go in there and I would do like squat thrust. You know what squat thrust is? You know, you know one, two, three, four, it's a, it's a powerful exercise. I would do maybe two or three minutes of that, initially hold me for a half an hour. Oh. It got to the point I was doing 15, 20 minutes of that, which is hard to do, and hold me for five or 10 minutes. So, yeah, I probably could have went to somebody and told them or whatever, but again, it's just not my nature to do that. So I, I just dealt with it. Um, after that experience, which lasted a couple days, not just that day, uh, my fingers and toes were numb for probably two or three months. Again, I never told anybody about it. You know, my wife, I told you, I'm telling. Um, that's just the way I was, you know. So that was, that was a tough, that was a tough time. I got through it. Um, these tough times are good because they are, you can rely on these tough times when you have tougher times in the future. It's a good thing in some respects. So, but I got, so I got through that training, and then I went from there to Fort Benning, Georgia, for um, uh, actually NCO training. It's kind of like OCS training. It is like it's the same thing as OCS, the officers training, but it's called NCO training. It's, a short, it's the same course, but shorter. So I did that. It's a voluntary program. That was an outstanding program. Uh, it was really tough. What that do you mean it program. was voluntary? You were sent uh, to you had a You had a volunteer for that, I believe. Now they would, now there was a, I would have went straight to Vietnam. I believe these were the options. From Fort Lewis, Washington, coming from advanced infantry training, I would have went straight to Vietnam, or you could go to, uh, they're looking to develop combat leaders. That's, that's what that school is designed for. So I went there, uh, I was there for a few days, at which time I realized that we were gonna be there for like 30 days before they started the training. And this was a problem. While I was there, a couple more guys would come. A few days would go by, a couple more guys would come. Eventually there was about 20 guys there. One day a lieutenant colonel comes walking through the barracks, says, uh, anybody have any concerns or problems? And actually when he did that, I raised my hand, I said, you know, yes sir, uh, I said, I just want to bring to your attention that myself and five or six other guys that are here now should have gotten a leave coming out of advanced infantry training. I said, if we started this training, or this training was started now, I wouldn't say nothing. Or if it was due to start in a week, I wouldn't say anything. But because I know we're going to be waiting here for guys to come in from all over the country before we start the training, I'm just bringing it to your attention that we should have got the leave. He left. I forgot, forgot all about it and, and really didn't think he was really would even try to do anything, frankly. However, <laughs> shortly after that, I was, my wife at that time worked for the airlines, and she had flown into uh, Fort Bend, Columbus, Georgia, which is close to Fort Bending, Georgia. I was actually with my wife, so that was my second AWOL, if you will. Um, I had a guy by the name of Newcomer. His wife took me to meet my wife at a hotel. I'm at the hotel, he calls me, again, there's no cell phones in, he calls me, he says, the company commander is looking to see you in his office now. Well, I'm like 20 minutes away with no transportation. Oh. I'm really panicking. I'm like, man, I gotta get back there soon. I now realized I left my jump boots in this woman's car. I have no way to contact her. So, cause I'm, I'm not, I'm not in a, a uniform that you tra travel in. I'm in, you know, work fatigues, you know, the, you see. <laughs> on the base, and now I gotta, um, I gotta get back to the base and I'm wearing uh, uh, like loafers, you know, low cut shoes. I look like an escape mental patient. <laughs> <laughs> so I get, I get into a taxi and I tell the guy, listen, you gotta get me back to uh, Camp uh, Fort Benning immediately. So the guy gets me there pretty quick. 
I'm running across the company area, and I'm, my heart's pounding because if anybody sees me, I'm in big trouble. I get to my barracks. I'm trying to, uh, the guys are all there yelling at me. You got to get up to the, you got to get up to the company commander's office. He's looking for you. The other guys that are due for a leave are already up there. So I'm trying to open my locker. It's a combination locker. You know, I'm fumbling with it. I'm all nervous. I finally get the thing open to get my other pair of jump boots out. Now I'm trying to put the boots on. You know, they have all sorts of laces and stuff. I finally get it on. I walk into the company commander's office, and as I walk in, I see the other guy standing there. I see the company commander, who I'm seeing for the first time, and I see him slam the phone down, and I know later that the guys told me he, he was a second away from knowing I'm not there. And he's right, I wasn't there until I just got there. So uh, <laughs> it's an amazing thing what happened. So rather than him asking me where the hell I was, I walk up, and as I'm approaching him like I'm approaching you, I see on his name tag, Wallace. Now, as you know, my name is Wallace. Now, he's looking at my record, and out of nowhere, he says to me, Wallace, what's the best ath athlete that ever came out of Seagirt, New Jersey? <laughs> I look at his desk, and I see a picture of Sports Illustrated on his desk with Bobby Verga, who was playing for Duke at the time, who I knew, who was from Seagirt, New Jersey, and I say to him, right here, sir, Bobby Verga, Seagirt, New Jersey. And that distracts him from whatever he might have said. And uh, then he goes on to tell me that the leave was approved and all me and these other guys got to go home uh, on leave. My wife, who flew out there, flew back, and I went by, you know, however I went, I can't remember, went back to her to New Jersey until I came back to start that oh, training. Okay. So that's another little side story. I had three AWOLs in my military service. That was the second one. That would have been a big problem, too. Had I got caught there, yeah, I'm sure I would have went to Vietnam the next day. But it didn't matter because I was going to Vietnam anyway because that, that, that training was to develop uh, leaders for Vietnam. That, that's what that training, you know, I knew what the training was for. And again, I wasn't trying to avoid it, uh, but again, I, I wasn't one for wasting any time. If you had something to do, I would do it. But if we were just sitting around doing cleaning the barracks, you know, no, I don't think so. so that's just part of my story. <laughs> Did the company commander, was he aware that you're the one who spoke up about um, getting a leave? I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think so. I don't think the guy I talked to was aware of it because, you know, he just said, does anybody have any concerns? I just raised my hand and said, I do. Myself and a couple, I think seven or eight other guys should have got to leave. That's all I said to him. I really didn't think he would care, honestly. Right. I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked when I got that call telling me they approved the leave and I, and I should be there. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, no, I shouldn't have left, but yeah, I came back quick. Mm -hmm. If I didn't get the call, I would have just came back the following day. Well, you were there. Were you taught by um, Vietnam combat veterans? Um, Vietnam combat veterans. Uh, let me think about it. <sighs> While I was there, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. I, I can't really remember to be honest with you. I don't. I don't know. Do any they, of your officers stand out? Well, you did talk well, about the drill instructor already. Well, Sergeant Case stood out yes. because he saved my life, <laughs> my military life. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, no, they were all good. I mean, I, I had nothing bad to say about anybody I ever met in the military, truthfully. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, your stories. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you did what you're supposed to do, you would have, <laughs> yeah, quote, uh, you would have no problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I could sit See, here's my thing. I believe that everybody should serve the country. Before then and now, every person, male, female, should serve the country in some capacity. You don't have to carry a rifle, you don't have to approve of any wars, but you should serve the country. If that was the case, trust me, it would be the best thing for the individual and would certainly be the best thing for the country. Another part of that is my son or me should have the same liability, risk of liability, as the president's son. And if you want to have a good country, the president's son should have the same chance of being drafted into a war as somebody coming from the ghetto. That's my personal opinion. Again, if you want the country to be run properly. Um, in the days I'm talking about, people with contacts uh, would get into the National Guard. There was a day, and people know what I'm talking about, there was a day that people went into the National Guard to avoid going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't, well, there came a day, uh, obviously, when that, when that ended, to the shock of many people who were in the National Guard at the time. Um, I'm not talking currently, but if you go back into the history, that's a fact. 
that people would get into the National Guard to avoid combat. Yeah. Uh, those days are, are long gone, right. I recognize. But I'm just trying to put a historical well, you look around reference. this room. Oh, no question, yeah. no question. But I'm just telling you how it was back in the day. And my point is, everybody should have the same chance of death representing the country, no matter where you are in the social economic strata. Is my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go after Georgia? Uh, from Fort Benning, Georgia, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana. In Fort Polk, Louisiana, I was a drill instructor for the advanced infantry. So you can see I went pretty much full circle. At this point, I'm now a drill instructor, not for basic training, but I'm a drill instructor for the advanced infantry. All of those people at the end of that training, including myself, are going to Vietnam. What that meant was, when the first day I got in Vietnam, I knew a lot of people. Well, because all the people that went through the training I just told you about at Fort Benning, Georgia, all of those people were going to Vietnam the same time as me, and all these people I'm training now in the advanced infantry, all of those people are going to Vietnam also. So yeah, the first day I hit Vietnam, I knew a lot of people well. You know, I knew them well. Kind of unusual also. I, I don't know, for me it wasn't unusual, it was just a fact. Yeah, so I just knew a lot of people. So from Louisiana, you went to Vietnam? From Fort Polk, Louisiana, I went directly to uh, Vietnam. And when was that? Uh, I see by looking at my record, I was in Vietnam for uh, uh, a year and a day. <laughs> I, knew it was, I knew it was a little late because we couldn't get out on time, but apparently it was one year and one, one day I spent in Vietnam. We were all flown into uh, Cameron Bay. So I went, entered the country flying into Cameron Bay. That was 1970? That was, I guess, about September 5th, 1970, yes, yes. Okay. And again, one of the worst days I had in Vietnam, or in the military, was the following day when they put me in a bunker by myself. I don't know if they did this for harassment purposes, I'm not really sure, uh, it didn't matter. But in any case, my second day in Cameron Bay, I was driven out to a, a bunker position by myself. I think I had an M50 or M60 machine gun. And I was in this like foxhole that was like, uh, had water down here and there was mosquitoes galore. Now, if you ever look at a Vietnam movie, you'll see the, the real troops, you know, real footage. And you look at their helmet, you'll see that little plastic vial of uh, mosquito repellent on their, in their helmet. Now, unfortunately, when I got dropped off there, either intentionally or whatever, I didn't have that mosquito repellent. And again, I didn't know nothing about it that day. So that night was, was hell for me because I'm there by myself. The mosquitoes are just eating me alive all night. I would try to get over a poncho liner. And, you know, they sound like uh, airplanes under there. And there's just nothing I could do. I was wow. just eating alive that whole night. Nothing I could do about it. And then, uh, so another part of the experience then, you know, I come from a religious background. I'm not a fanatic or anything, but I, I'm a religious person. I did a little reading of the Bible before going to Vietnam. I figured it was a good time. I did find, by the way, that there is no atheists in foxholes. I find that personally true. But nevertheless, I was concerned about you know, whether I'd be able to shoot somebody and uh, having thoughts like that, which I think are normal for a young person. But that night, I'm in the foxhole by myself. Um, the first time I heard some rustling or movement out there, there was no doubt in my mind I was going to pull that trigger on that M50 or M60 machine gun without any hesitation. I didn't have to, but you know, because nothing more than that happened, but I was more than prepared as of that second to uh, you know, be a combat soldier, uh, same as anybody else would do, I believe. To use your training in the, in the location where you found yourself? Uh, yeah, I don't know how much training I had there. Uh, you know, I, like I say, they dropped me off. To, no, I mean to use your training that you went through all the time. Well, I had a lot of training. I mean, I mean, I trained for a whole year in the infantry, if you look at it before going to Vietnam. That's a lot of training. And the training in the military is outstanding. I mean, it really is. Did that yeah. include the 81 millimeter mortars? Yes. The infantry yeah. training? Okay. Well, see, this is another thing. If you look at my uh, MOS, it'll, you'll see 11 Charlie. 11 Charlie is what we call a glorified infantryman. It's kind of a joke in, among ourselves. And that, in the infantry, they're either 11 Bravo or 11 Charlie. But really, it's all 11 Bravo. Uh, the chance of getting to getting work with the mortars is rare. Oh. Although, in my case, I did. Uh, but really, 11, anything 11 is infantry. You know, I think only, what, a half a percent of the population ever gets to really serve in the military. And our whole population. 
So think about it. There's a very small amount of people in the country have any uh, knowledge of what really goes on in, in a war situation. Right. All right, so um, you said it was the worst night of your life. Did, did you mean with the mosquitoes? Oh, yeah. If I put you out in a, in, a, in a place infested with mosquitoes and you're by yourself all night, it's going to be a bad night. You know, yeah, it was bad. Could you catch malaria or you... Uh, I could have. This is another thing I thought of years later. When I went to my first fire base, which was Fire Base Tomahawk, and again, I was told, uh, I don't know if it was true or not, but I was always told that before I got there that that fire base, they tried to overrun it five days before I got there. I know that Fire Base Tomahawk was uh, under heavy attack because, talk about the National Guard, you had, I think, four guys killed in, in June 1969 on an attack of Fire Base Tomahawk, all from the same town, which was... Uh, uh, Kentucky? It was in Kentucky, I want to say, uh, Bards, Bardstown, Bardstown, Kentucky. From one town of 5,000 people, Did you four say people were killed there at Fire Base Tomahawk, 15 were killed from that town in Vietnam. That's a heavy hit for one town, big time. Big time. Where was Firebase Tomahawk in Vietnam? Uh, Firebase Tomahawk was above Da Nang. Like in, our, in Da Nang, well, first of all, they divide the country into four quadrants. It's called one, two, three, four. Four being Saigon. One, we called it I Corps. We didn't call it, uh, we didn't call it, what we called I Corps. And that was uh, you know, the northern part Central of Hunters. South Vietnam. That would be uh, above Da Nang, where the Marines were in Da Nang. We were above that way, flew by. Uh, that area there was where the 101st Airborne was located. Okay. I think that's up by the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the DMZ. Um, again, I'm not a historical. <laughs> uh, okay. Anything, really. So now I'm there with the 101st Airborne. Now, I was told that what happened five days before I got there, you want me to tell that story or not? Um, if you look at the picture, or matter of fact, if you go online, which I did yesterday for the first time ever, and looked up Firebase Tomahawk, the first thing you'll see is this sign here, which this is a picture I took. These are my pictures. I don't know if you can. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I'll give it to you. All right, this is a picture I took of Firebase Tomahawk when I was there. And uh, no slack. Yeah. Now my bunker, it's a, a motor bunker, 81 millimeter motor bunker. It's located right behind that sign. That's the first place I ever was. Now, a fellow by the name of Johnson told me this story of what happened before I got there. Do you want me to film anything else besides um, while you're talking? Is uh, Johnson not, in that picture? No, not right now. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. get to that. Go ahead. Maybe. <laughs> but in any case, so that's a picture I took, and that's a picture anybody can see if they look up Firebase Tomahawk, you'll see that picture. So this guy Johnson, who I got to know, told me that what happened is that he, there was a, a new cherry in country. We use the term cherry to refer to anybody coming new into the, into the fire base. So at that time, I was a new cherry, but he's telling me a story about a cherry that was in country and said to him, what should I be doing here? And my friend told me, he told the guy, listen, don't worry about it. Just look out here. And he's panning with his rifle. Look out here every once in a while. And when he did that, he sees uh, the enemy walking towards his position. Now, I always took this as, if the guy doesn't ask him this question, within two seconds, these guys are all dead, I'm not telling you this story, and things get a lot worse. Um, when he saw that, he opened, fi he opened fire on his weapon, they started firing mortar rounds, illumination rounds, and all hell broke loose, and according to him, 33 of the enemy was found in the, in the wire surrounding Firebase Tomahawk the next day. Now, again, whether it's true, I don't know, that's what I was told, because when that happened, that night, I was laying on a board in our, on a piece of wood in that foxhole right behind that sign. And I thought I was going to get killed immediately because I woke up in the middle of the night and I was bouncing off that board. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this, we got incoming rounds. I'm going to be killed here my first day at Firebase Tomahawk. I was glad to find out that it wasn't incoming rounds, but it was, we had artillery, uh, I don't know what you call it, division or battalion, I don't know. But we had like 105s, we had 155s and 175s on the base with us. Howitzers? Yeah. And uh, you know, big, long, you'll see pictures I have that I took. I mean, the barrels are like telephone poles. And what it was, was our, our side firing, and the concussion is knocking me off the, my board. And we turn on the lights, and I'd see these little scorpions running around. 
And I'm like, oh man. So when I, we turned, because we're a fire direction center, we had to plot the mortars, so we had the lights. And uh, so I saw the little scorpions after that, man. I tell you, I just laid on that board like this. I never moved <laughs> for a while. But you get used to that, you know, because you, know, you would see some tarantulas and we would just spray them with uh, uh, lighter fluid, kill them right away. We'd just pin them up on the wall. Other spiders they had there were really big and fast. I never killed one of them. And you would see some, uh, like I call them, what, like centipedes or, or a thousand leggers, but they were right. big, like slimy, uh, purplish. You, know, you see them every once in a while. Yeah, so you get used to any type of bug in the United States was like nothing. Right. Um, and that never really caused a problem. I only one guy that got bit in the face one that I, while well, I was there, you know, swelled up bad. But other than that, it wasn't really a problem on that fire base. See, eventually we became a swing battalion. Our, so initially I was there at fire base Tomahawk. Then our battalion became a swing battalion, which meant when other battalions went back to rest, R&R, &R, whatever they did, mm. we would go out there and take over their, their uh, area. So that presented some problems for us because, you know, one area might have mortars coming in at you, another area you'd have rats all over the place. You know, it was different, just different experiences uh, based on where you were. But, um, yeah, so my, my experience at Firebase Tomahawk was good, it was good. I have to get a little drink here, sorry, am I talking now? All right, so here's what happened. One of the first days I was there, a guy I met, this guy has some pictures up here from, uh, somewhere in the south, uh, I called him Lester Maddox, his last name was Maddox. He was telling me about some sort of incident that took place in the art, and all the captains and the artillery people were, were in the command bunker discussing what happened. And I remember looking at the plotting board and saying to myself, oh, I know what happened. So I took the board and I went to the, where, where all the big shots were on the fire base and I, you know, walked in there and I said to uh, the people in there, in particular, Captain uh, Trumbo, Craig Trumbo, I said, sorry, I just, I, I heard about this, I think I can explain what happened. And he looked at me like, yeah, right, <laughs> get the hell out. So I, I looked back at him like, hey, okay, you know what, my opinion, I'll leave. So based on these facial expressions, I think, I don't know, I started to walk out and he stopped me. He said, all right, well, what, what do you got to say? I, had what, I said what I had to say and I left. About, I, I don't know the time frame, maybe a month or two after that, Captain Trumbo called me back into the command uh, bunker and said to me, how would you like to be stay in this bunker here with me and do whatever I'm doing? And you know, I'm thinking to myself, like I have a choice. But maybe I did. In retrospect, I think I did have a choice. But that time, I'm like, okay. Yes, sir. So, yeah, exactly. And uh, so that's what I did. So for a long period of time, I was in the command bunker with uh, Captain uh, Craig Trumbo, who we all called Smoke. That was his nickname, Smoke. Now obviously in this situation, him and I became very close friends, very close friends. And um, there's another part of the story because we had another, another uh, uh, first sergeant who used to come out to the fire base. His name was First Sergeant Teodoro. And everybody thought this guy was just brutal, heartless. And I did too for, for a while. And these two guys didn't get along. So what would happen? Like the first sergeant would come out, and he came out. He had his helmet on. He'd have a big, thick flak jacket or, or vest on. And you know, on the fire base, we didn't do that. You know, we, you know, it just didn't happen. And uh, but he come out. When he did come out, that's how he dressed. But what happened one night, one day, uh, he was taking a shower. On fire base, Tomahawk is very unique, I think, and that we had this big boat out there. If you look at the pictures online, which I did yesterday. <laughs> Because I wasn't sure. I looked at Firebase Tomahawk. I'm like, no, that's not Firebase Tomahawk. The place looked really bad. And I'm like, I remember this being, man, not so bad. And I'm looking. I said, this can't be it. This can't be it. But then I saw the boat. I said, that's definitely it. Because we had this big boat. Take a look, folks. <laughs> Firebase Tomahawk, look at this boat. Out there in the middle of the jungle, we had this big boat up on stilts. And that would fill with water. And oh, we okay. would go under there and take a shower under the boat. Well, one day, this guy here, First Sergeant Teodoro, was under there taking a shower. And he had terrible hearing. And you can see some rounds hitting into the jungle around us. And, you know, so you just get in your bunker or whatever. And I went out, but rather than do that, I went out and told him, hey, you know, you better get out of the shower and go in there. Now, I wasn't running through, you know, like you see in the movies, machine gun fire or anything like this. I just went and told him. And, but ever since I did that, this guy treated me like his son. Ever since I did that, a lot of guys would have just not done it, even if they could have. And, um, but I did it, and ever since then, 
When he came out to the fire base, for example, after that, and again, it was very rare. If he was out there 10 days, it was a lot during the year. But the next time he came out, he, he uh, called me into his uh, um, bunker and he said, hey, I cooked up some soup or whatever he had, I don't know. He said, would you want some? And he called me Wally. Most of the guys, you see my hat even, it says Wally. Everybody there called me Wally. So he said, Wally, do you want some soup? I said, okay. So I got to know him a little bit. And actually that night, he said to me, and I could see his concern. I thought the guy was heartless up until this conversation. Oh, okay. He said, we need to send somebody out to do something. I can't even remember what it was. And he suggested the person he was going to send uh, be somewhat expendable. He was, and he was worried about it, too. And so I knew the guy had a heart. And uh, so I said to him, I said, listen, Top, don't worry about it. I said, I'll, I'll take one or two of my guys with me, and we'll do what, whatever it was he wanted done. But that part, I, and I remember the guy's name. I'm not going to say it here on, on the thing, but... It, at least he showed me he was concerned, even with this guy, but he was really uh, in a lot of stress as to what he was going to do and who he was going to send and it would be dangerous. It wasn't that dangerous, but that's what he thought. So, yeah, we did it, whatever. I can't remember what it was, but we did it. And uh, when I went back to Camp Eagle, we, our stand there was back in Camp Eagle. Well, when we went back to Camp Eagle, you know, the first sergeant would call me into his, his uh, barracks. He had a whole barracks to himself. And he'd be like, hey, Wally. He says, you know, no problem while you're back here for a few days. You know, you could stay here. He had a lot of beds in there. And, uh, you know, stand this nice, you know, American bed and stuff. I said, Top, I said, I appreciate it. I said, I can't stay there. I said, my guys are down here, you know, sleeping in the cots, which was good. You know, yeah, well, you know however many cots there were. Jammed in there. I said, no, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I got to go with my guys and, and sleep in the cots, same as everybody else. But the point is, you see the guys trying to, uh, you know, look out after me. And he always did. When he left Vietnam, because he left before me, before he left, he came up to me and said, listen, whatever you can do for this guy, he was a Filipino. First Sergeant Teodoro was a Filipino. And he came up to me and said, Wally, whatever you can do to look out for the safety of uh, Robertson, which is what another guy I have in one of my pictures, who was another Filipino. The guy's like six foot tall Filipino. He's taller than me. Mm -hmm. And we used to make a lot of trips uh, in the jungle together. I think I have a picture here. You're you all right, this is a, a picture of the person I'm talking about. So first, Sergeant Teodora is telling me to do whatever I can, if possible. And again, you know, right here, it, yeah, right here. And that's a picture of him. Him, I think that was taken. Him and I went and uh, supplied our some of our, I think, snipers or recon with uh, some uniforms. We had to drive through the countryside, just the two of us. And uh, I tell you, the countryside—it's it's, it's so beautiful. You come all of a sudden, you come across these waterfalls. It's just stunning. I, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time in some helicopters for different reasons, and you know, I've traveled the world more so than most people. Again, my wife at that time worked for uh, airlines. Oh, you said so, that, right. So we could travel anywhere for like nothing. And uh, oh, that's my hat I see her showing there. Now that hat, I actually wore that hat in Vietnam, but it didn't have all that stuff on it. Uh, it did have Sargent, it had did New have Jersey. Wally, it had New Jersey. Uh, all the other stuff I put on, I might, it might have had Southeast Asia, uh, war game participant that might have been on there, uh, but the other stuff probably wasn't on until uh, you know I got back to the United States. I wear that hat every every year. Uh, I have seven grandchildren, and three of them oh. and their parents take me to Applebee's every Veterans Day. <laughs> it's kind of funny because they take me out for dinner, which is free at Applebee's by the way for veterans. Right. Which I, I should uh, comment uh, that's an outstanding thing that Applebee's does. Yes. And I do appreciate that on behalf of the veterans. So every Veterans Day, one of my grandchildren will wear that hat, and I have other uh, Vietnam hats, they'll wear them, and we'll go to Applebee's and have our, which we just did, you know, recently. Um, okay, well, I forgot where I Because at the time, my wife worked for the airlines, so I could fly anywhere for basically nothing. Um, but nevertheless, even to this day, probably the most impressive uh, sights that I've ever seen go back to Vietnam. When I'm in the helicopters, flying, in those days, over the jungles of Vietnam, it was unbelievable. Because it's like going back to prehistoric times, is the best way I could describe it. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Like and untouched? Untouched. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you look in one direction, you would see, see the ocean there, you know? Another direction, from the same view, you would see the, uh, all the rice paddies. You turn in another direction, you see nothing but the jungle. Yeah, it's just awestruck with the, with the view. Mm -hmm. Flying around, flying around in helicopters, and for you know at different times for different reasons. I had one veteran tell me that if there wasn't a war going on, it would be a nice place to go on vacation. 
Well, I don't know what you would do in those days. I know currently, uh, I guess it is a, a vacation oh, true, spot yes. today. In, in those days, uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, I shouldn't say that because, here, see, again, I was in northernmost Vietnam. There's, there's nothing there. You know, I used to hear stories about guys sending home for money, um, you know, re up and to stay there. I'm like, well, yeah, what's going on? How can this be? Well, I found out through uh, circumstances. There came a time when I brought a prisoner from I Corps, you know, where we were, all the way down to Four Corps to Saigon, LBJ, Long Green Jail. I brought a prisoner down to Long Green Jail. I was by myself. After I dropped the prisoner off, I got lost, and I found the MACV compound. And I'm like, whoa, this is a whole nother world down here. Mm -hmm. And I saw my people were running out of money. I went to a show that night for $1.29, I got a steak, a dinner, they had the Vietnamese women, beautiful women, singing American songs perfectly. And I said, I think I'll come back another night. This is another one of my AWOL stories. This is the last one. Oh, okay. So uh, I said, no, I'm not going to go back here. Now, I, at this time, I had, I was kind of a short timer then. I had a lot of time in. Sergeant Teodoro, who I was talking about, already left, told me to look after Robertson if I could. So I know, I knew that he probably would have said to people above me, hey, look out after this guy. Do whatever you can. I'm confident he said that. Um, so uh, I'm in, I'm in uh, Saigon and I went to uh, a movie. They had a movie there. I saw the movie and they had a preview for another movie which was called Darker Than Amber. I still remember it. I saw I like that preview. I came back another day. When I say that, it's because I'm another day AWOL as I'm doing these things. So I wound up, I was four or five days AWOL from taking this prisoner. I wasn't too worried about it at that time. But nevertheless, I didn't, know, I didn't know what was going to happen because that new first sergeant, who I never saw in my life, was going to be there when I got back at Camp Eagle. So eventually I got back to Camp Eagle, and I'm walking in the company area, and I see the first sergeant walking towards me. Well, yeah, I recognize him. Uh, I had never spoken to him in my life. He had never spoken to me in my life, but I knew who he was. He knew who I was. I'm about to pass him as I'm walking to Camp Eagle there, and he says to me, Wally, what are you doing back so soon? Well, that was... Oh, you know, he's teasing you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know. So that told me that Sergeant Teodoro probably said something to him, and, you know, that was fine. From there, rather... Oh, I did go out to the fire base from there. I can't remember the fire bases anymore, which is, uh, I don't know, good and bad. From there, I went to, I think, fire base... I want to say Normandy. Oh, I should backtrack a second. While I was there, they had the Bob Hope show, which was great. I love Bob Hope for all the stuff he did for the veterans to this day. To me, he's the greatest American. Well, while I was in Vietnam, he came there with Lola Falana, was a big star then. And uh, they flew us back from where we were. We had all the front row seats were reserved for us, which was really nice. And the show was great. And at that show, I met my friend here. I'm gonna show you a picture of him. His name was Richard Goggin. And I knew him from the, from the States. And he was, he was with the first of the 327th Infantry. Again, I was with the second of the 327th Infantry, which really meant we had the same jobs, just different areas. Okay. So in this picture here, I want you to see this. I'll let you hold it. Mm -hmm. So this picture was taken, and about five, six, seven days after that picture was taken, I went out to fire base, uh, I think it was Normandy, I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of times I would go, I, I told you before, we were a swing battalion. So we would go out, go to these different battalions and take over their area. For whatever reason, I would be sent out with, with like an advanced party, two, three, four, five people, small group, myself included, would go out to the next fire base before our whole unit got there. When I went to the next fire base, I think it was Normandy, might not have been. I, again, I told you I knew a lot of people in Vietnam. When I got to that fire base, I ran into an E6 that I knew from, from the uh, training program in Benning. And I think his name was, uh, I want to say Thurman. I'm not sure. But in any case, I'm talking to him. And he says to me, did you hear that Goggin was killed? I said, no, it can't be. I just saw him. He goes, well, I, you know, that's what I heard. Now again, I had a lot of contacts, I had a lot of power, informal power, for different reasons. So I was able to get a helicopter for myself from that fire base and go back to Camp Eagle. And I wound up going to an area, wasn't Camp Eagle, but somewhere else back there, 
where I actually found and talked to the medics that pulled out my friend and another guy I didn't know, two bodies, out of the uh, waters there, and they were listed as drown drowning. Now this always bothered me to this day, and I'll tell you why. I had one dream in Vietnam. Excuse me. I had one dream in Vietnam, and this is the dream. I was at this fire base, the same fire base my friend winds up being killed at, and my dream is this. I wait, you ever have a dream you wake up and you're not sure if it's real or not? I have one of those dreams. The only dream I ever had in Vietnam, and this is it. I wake up, and I'm standing at this stream with uh, Johnson, this guy Johnson I talked about before, because we used to go down, me and Johnson used to take a Jeep, and we would go down to this stream and resupply our snipers, resupply them with uh, ammunition, food, the oh. two of us would do that. And one day, you know, we parked the Jeep, you know, a considerable distance away from the stream. Now, not real far, but you could see it, but it wasn't real close where I could just grab a weapon real quick, and that bothered me that I was doing it, but I did it anyway. I think at that time I might have carried an M uh, uh, a 45 on my hip also, I'm not sure, but sometimes I did, but my M16 I know I left in the Jeep. And we walked up, we made the delivery, I forgot all about it. Well, that night I had this dream, and the dream is, I'm standing there by the stream, I hear some movement in the like weeds where you can't see really that what's, what's really there, and I look over there and I see uh, Vietnamese soldiers coming towards me, and I now look in the other direction, and I see Vietnamese soldiers coming there, and I remember turning to Johnson in the dream, just like, he's this close to me as you are, and saying to him, Oh, F. I'm like, just like that. And I woke up, boom. Now what's, it, what's weird about this dream is my friend about, well, I don't know, a month or two after this dream, the key being after this dream, this is how I believe my friend died. Now, I never checked the military records. People told me he was listed as drowning, which always bothered me. The guy was a powerful uh, individual. He didn't drown. He might have been drowned. Uh, uh, yes. Um, Again, to this day I don't know, but I'm confident that him and this other guy in his unit were drowned at that location by some enemy uh, forces. That's what I believe happened. So there was um, no shooting? What did the, the medics tell you? Um, you didn't have bullet wounds? I, I don't think, no. I didn't, I didn't get to talk to the, ex those men. I went to the medical unit where other guys told me that the medics told them that they, they, yeah, they died, they drowned. So I don't know. Maybe he did have some bullet wounds. I uh, hope that he did in some respects, and I know he didn't drown. You know, it always bothers me, still bothers me that they said he drowned. So uh, I don't know if there's some way to find out, but, you know, in any case, he died, which was tragic. As any, I mean, any soldier that's ever died in any war is tragic. Right. So. Did you ever speak with his family afterward? No, but I, I thought about it. You know, I thought about it. You know, yeah, I did. I, I thought about it many times. You know, and actually what happened, here's what happened. I told, I told you I was in the command bunker with uh, Captain Trumbo. It's just the two of us. Obviously, we're going to be close, and we were close. A time came when he was going to get... Well, first of all, Captain Trumbo had been in Vietnam a year before that, served a year before this year. He was Airborne Ranger Special Forces. This guy was a serious career soldier. There came a time when he was going to get transferred out into one of the infantry units, and he told me about it and asked me if I wanted to go with him. Now, this was tough because I was tight with him, and I contemplated it, but I didn't do it because at the time I was married, and, you know, the, living on a fire base is a lot different life than the people who are right around us. You know, we travel battalion strength. Our company is, is Echo Company. Echo Company is the mortars, the recon, and the snipers. It's a specialized company. The other companies, A, B, C, D, are around the fire base. It's one big unit, but the, the living conditions for the people who are off the fire base are, are much, you know, I have a shelter over my head, it's entirely different, entirely different. Although, I have seen soldiers come onto the fire base and they would be like shaken. And I'd be like, what are you doing? Because they would be nervous to be on the fire base because they knew the enemy knew exactly where they were. Uh, and they were more comfortable in the jungle, ironically. Mm. Yeah, I found it surprising, but is, yeah. it is what it is. But in any case, the living conditions were certainly night and day. The guys out there living in the jungle, you know, I, I, I mean, in monsoon season, you heard about, I mean, I was more cold in Vietnam than hot. People find that surprising. But when it rains, I mean, it rains and it doesn't stop and it gets cold. 
I mean, we said, you know, we'd probably open the uh, Claymore mines, take out the C4, and light that stuff up, stuff up for all sorts of reasons. And uh, yeah, so I, 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 you know, part of me wanted to go with him because you know it's just a camaraderie type of thing. But I didn't go, and I was glad I didn't go because what happened after that? Captain Trumbo was assigned. To, he was in charge of all the air operations for the 101st Airborne. That's at I Corps. Now again, we were tight. He was, you know, mili you know, some, you know military people are, good ones are a little uh, eccentric. <coughs> what he would do, believe it or not, he would fly out to the, to the fire base that I was at, because he would know where I was at. I had no idea where he was at, but he would know where I was at. He would fly out in the command chopper, pick me up on the fire base that I was at, it, come up to me, say, Wally, we had to do whatever, chopper shot down or something like this, you want to go for a ride. Now think about it, I'm not even in his unit now. You want to go for a ride? I would say, yeah, okay. I would get out to the command chopper with Captain Trumbo, and we would take off. Behind us would be the Cobra gunships. There would be the big shit hooks carrying these big nets of uh, napalm. You know, that, I think it's called food gas, whatever, napalm. And we would go out on these missions, and the helicopter pilots were spectacular. I mean, they would drive those things like race car drivers. And uh, I think we would like mark the target with smoke, get out of there, and all hell would break loose. I mean, they, they would come in, they would, the, the Cobra gunships would be firing away, the napalm would be dropping, and they would bring me back to the fire base. Now, this was good and bad for me because you have to put this in military perspective. I'm just a sergeant at the time, although actually the company put me in for E6 when I was in Vietnam about three months. I actually go through the whole promotion process, was actually promoted to E6, but at that time, the Army went to centralized promotion in the whole military. And as the way they explained it to me, I would get the E6 promotion when the next one became available. Still so, like that, yeah. Yeah. So even though, so yeah, I was moving. My career was moving quick. I mean, I was only in the military. If you look at my record, I was in the military for less than two years and was up for E6 three months into Vietnam, and even when I got out, they offered me E7, believe it or not, and $10,000 if I stayed in the military. Uh -huh. And I might have done it. If I wasn't married, I might have done it. Right. I liked, you know, I, I liked the military. But being married, I wanted no part of that, and, and I didn't. But when I got out of Vietnam, they gave me $10,000 because I earned it. You know, combat pay. I couldn't spend any money where I was. Not, you know, if I spent $10, it was a lot of money. And uh, so that was, what, 1972, I came home. I bought a house in Wall Township for 37.5. Now think about it, that's 37.5, and I put down 10,000. That's a pretty good down payment, which Vietnam allowed me to do. And that was the time when interest rates were going up. People thought I was crazy that I borrowed money at 8%. If you go back and look at the interest rates in that time, 1972. But what happened, I found out later, I got the last mortgage out of Mass Guan Savings Bank that they issued for a long time. Because after that, immediately after that, the interest rates went to 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 percent at that time, and you couldn't even get a mortgage. That's when all that variable mortgage came in. I hit a home run by luck. There's nothing I calculated, just luck. I sold that house I bought for 37.5 in 1972. I sold that house in 1986 for 215 thousand dollars. Now. Look at that inflation factor. I put the inflation in there so you can see. Mm -hmm. People had to go a lifetime to get that type of inflation. I got it during a very short span of time. Mm -hmm. If I waited six months to buy that house, I could have never afforded it. That's how the prices escalated during that 1972, 73, 74 period in the state of New Jersey. It has nothing to do with the military, it's just mm -hmm. life. Okay. Did you have any uh, contact with the Mountain Yards? Uh, very limited. Uh, as you know, I brought two crossbows here. Can you talk about the mountain yards? I can talk about them briefly. I had limited contact with them, but I'm familiar with them. I know that the special forces worked with them a lot. Mm -hmm. I described them as uh, like Vietnamese bodybuilders. That's how I personally described oh. them, because they were like big, powerful Vietnamese. And I know some of the special forces, maybe the Green Berets, worked with them on a very close basis. We did. I came across them at one of the fire bases. I, 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 probably maybe once or twice ever when I was off the fire base because I told you I would go off the fire base for different reasons and one time I was out there uh, doing something and I saw some, some of the uh, uh, we call them mountain yards 
it's not correct, but that's what we call them, yards or mountain yards. I saw several of them, and I wound up trading them, uh, probably sea rations, I'm not really sure, lerps maybe, uh, for three crossbows. What are lerps again? I forget. Long range reconnaissance uh, patrols. It's like they come in a packet, uh, and we used to use it, our uh, people going out on recon, we used, we'd, oh, they're great. I had uh, cravings for them for many years after being back in the United States, because, you know, if you're eating the sea rations, I mean, that'll get you by, but the lerps, you know, you get uh, chicken and rice, I forget, I forget them anymore, spaghetti, some of them were outstanding. What you do, you would take them out, they're dry food, put them in your canteen or whatever, warm them up with a little C4, and eat it. They're really, really good, really good. They're hard to get. Mm -hmm. But in any case, so I traded for three crossbows, Montego crossbows, and uh, one broke when I was trying, big one, bigger than what I brought here, when I was taking it apart and two survived. I had to take them apart because I was afraid of getting, a th get, yeah, I couldn't get them through, through all these countries back right. in the United States, the way you see them. So I took them apart, I put them in a box, and I was always concerned about the, uh, the feathers, which are made with bamboo. I was concerned with agricultural restrictions, uh, besides the weapons. But you know, as you can see, I got them home. One way or the other, I got them home, and there they are. Mm -hmm. um, you want me to hold them up for, to see? Sure, or? yeah. yeah. I'm on my wall until today, actually. This is, this is the middle one. I had one bigger than this, believe it or not. And this is a smaller one that I got from that brief encounter. Do you want to demonstrate that it's still... Oh, these are, yeah, this is, these are over 40 years old that I've had them. Mm -hmm. And uh, pulling this back is very difficult. I, mean, I have to use a lot of force to get that back. And the, the, the construction is ingenious. And then you would take the arrow right here. A lot of times they would dip this in various stuff. There's a little razor here, a piece of razor, and the arrow would stick right on the, I'm not going to put it there because it's loaded, would stick on there. And it's just a matter of uh, pulling the trigger. Listen, listen to the pull of this. You hear that? Oh, Trust okay. me. You wouldn't be able to pull that back. You saw the fellow there before trying to pull that back, one of the men. He didn't pull it back, you notice. He tried to pull it back. It's very strong. Okay. And uh, the point is, after so, all these years, these weapons are still functional. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. What other weapon did you say you brought back? Switch plate? Well, yeah. This, uh, I brought this back. There's some stories with this I'll leave out, but in any case, this switch plate, I, somebody gave it to me over in Vietnam when he went back, you know, to the United States. I just carried it with me always. I still have it. It was very difficult for me to get this back into the United States for many reasons. I think I was searched probably two or three times. Uh, fortunately, in those days, there was no you, know, you didn't go through any metal detectors. Oh, okay. I didn't even know if they even had any. But if they did, they didn't use them. So basically what would happen, you know, they, they did search me, but you know, I, would, I would kind of be like this. They'd put your arms out, and I would go something like this. You, know, you can see here, the switchblade is there. And for me, it worked. I still have it. It's a, it's a keepsake. Uh -huh. I had other weapons while I was there. I tried to get home. I'll show you some real quick, like I can find them in my scrapbook. I had two or three AK-47s. I did try to get those home, but that didn't work. So I just left them with other guys when I, when I left the country. Here, here's, here's me right here. These are, these are again, just my personal scrapbook. Right. But this is me at Firebase Tomahawk. Uh, you can see my hat that okay. I, I have there, by the way. That's the same hat without all those decorations. And there's the AK-47, one, one, one that I had right here. Right. So don't worry about it. Yeah, the other pictures, don't stick on these pictures anymore. Okay. So yeah, getting those back into the country was uh, not possible. The last part of my service, I went, I went out to another fire base. I, I can't remember the name of the fire base. And there was a new, captain that came in there that was rubbing a lot of the people the wrong way. I didn't get to know him too, too well, as this story will tell, but it was a bad situation. Um, I won't say too much to identify this captain, but let's put it this way. I, I, went, I went to go into my command. To, I, I stayed at the command bunker also here. And I went into the command bunker one night. There was only three people in there. Me, the guy I'm talking about, and uh, uh, a Sergeant Poisson, I believe is the way you pronounce it. It was an E, I think it was an E7. And I go in there and I see this E7 putting uh, 
sandbags up, dividing the company commander's space from my space and his space. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm wondering why he's doing this. Later that day, again, I told you I knew a lot of people, one of the guys from the infantry, not from, not from our uh, unit there, but one of the infantry guys there for whatever reason, comes up to me and says, hey, Wally, I wouldn't sleep in that bunker tonight if I was you. Now think about it. There's a guy coming up to me and saying, hey, Wally, I wouldn't sleep in that bunker if I was you. Mm -hmm. So nothing happened that particular night. Based on what was going on, I, I used what influence I had. I don't know how I did it, but I managed myself to get back to Camp Eagle, and I was now stationed on the bunker line there, mortar position, I think for one of the cavalry units. It wasn't, it wasn't 101st Airborne. But that's where I now was with about maybe five or six other guys. I subsequently heard that that captain, there was some sort of incident where that captain wasn't killed, but he was injured uh, seriously enough where he was taken back to the United States. What happened there, I don't know. <laughs> Whether it was enemy related, I don't know. But oh, like fragging or something? Yeah, it's possible. It's po based on my knowledge of the, the environment, it's possible. I know these uh, things happen, of course. I, yeah, I don't know. I met the military records, probably some part of the person The tone in which you were told you probably this shouldn't is, sleep this, there? Well, serious? based on what happened, based on the fact that I see the guy building the, the sandbags, dividing our, our sleeping area with the company commander on one side of these bags and me and him on the other side, yeah, that's bizarre. Oh, now I understand. In okay. the same room, if you will. All right, bunker. That same day, a guy behavior. from the infantry company, who I didn't know, but knew me, comes up and says, hey, Wally, I wouldn't sleep in there if I was you. All right? Now, at some point in time, I got out of that unit because I had the power to do it. I had the contacts to do it. Not that I was afraid, not that I really thought that would happen, although maybe in retrospect I sh should have. I never saw any incident of that during my military service. I've heard of it. And I don't know if that happened or not, but I did hear subsequent to me leaving that uh, that captain was injured somehow. Right. So for the rest of my career, I'm now called a short timer. I have my short time calendar. I'm sure guys have talked about the short time calendar. You know, talk about so you would draw a helmet and you put little sections on it, and you'd have like whatever 30 days, 29, 28 down to one, and you would color it in every day, color in your little short time calendar. So I was at that phase of my. Uh, military service that that's what I was doing and actually what a tragic uh, event happened sort of there we had a young kid come there that, that was in country a short period of time was staying with us going back to the United States I, I don't know his name but they were sending him back to the United States because his wife and child were in grave danger of dying he goes he comes back and we kept him there with us so that was fantastic news so here's this young kid, he's with us, he's not supposed to be there, we knew he wasn't supposed to be there, but we just kept him there for a while, I don't know how long, but eventually I realized, hey, where's this kid? And he goes back out to the fire base, one of our fire bases, I don't know which fire base. Well, he's on the fire base, and one of his best friend, I heard, his best friend, is fooling around with an M16 and accidentally kills this kid. Now this kid's dead, you know, we got attached to the kid, it could be worse circumstances. The guy who shot him is totally worthless. They had to send him back to the United States. So that was, that was a tragic incident that sort of happened there. At that fire, actually the closest I came to being killed that I'm aware of also occurred at that location. Because, you know, we were, that's a relaxed area. I consider that whole area to be safe, although from where we were, but really I guess you're never safe. But one day I got this bright idea. I was, to come home and I figured well you know what I'm gonna go up on top of this bunker and I'll just put a little I'll lay out there and get a nice tan because I'm gonna, gonna be getting home and I was up there for a short period of time and the round goes right past my ear mm. so by the grace of God <laughs> I mean this guy's just a bad shot so I got a sniper taking a shot at me if, uh, you know round goes past your head it, it's very distinct and that's the last time I ever did that but I was lucky that was that was I was, I was lucky many times you have to be lucky uh, in any war situation, and that was a situation where I, I was definitely very lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of my time, I spent right there in that, in that uh, bunker position. You know, a lot of stories, any Vietnam vet you can tell hundreds of stories about stuff that happened. <laughs> One night, we went down, what we used to do, here's the thing, in the United States, the, the, the borders, 
crew is like three people. It's three people mortar crew. In the Vietnam, the guys get so good, you only need one guy. One guy's better than three guys that, that's doing it all the time. So what we would do, we would take, leave just a, a minimum guys there, and the rest of us would go down and sneak into the R&R &R areas or, or the, um, where they're having uh, shows and stuff with other units. We would just melt in there and then come back. So a funny story is, this guy Caldwell from, he's in some of my pictures, he's a southern boy, good guy. He was always proud, I'm not a drink, I still don't drink, but he's giving me a hard time. You drinking when I'm drinking, you drinking when I'm drinking. Eventually I said, yeah, okay, I'm drinking when you're drinking. Well, he started throwing his drinks all over the wall, we stopped drinking. We're coming back, we had to cross the stream to get back up to our mortar position from where we were. And he falls into the stream, drunk, had his camera that he bought, brand new camera, destroyed. And we made it back to our, our position. And uh, the funny part of this story is he writes to the company, tells him he was out on patrol and, uh, and do enemy fire and all this other stuff. And he, he wound up getting a new free camera, but that wasn't really what really happened. Oh, okay. So, uh, but going back to my friends, so the people I had the closest relationship to in Vietnam, one I told you Richard Goggin died. How do you spell his name? G-O-G-G-I-N. I've seen his name at the wall in uh, Washington. That's a very moving uh, wall for any veteran. I was only there once, but uh, yeah, it's something. Um, so my closest friends really were First Sergeant Teodoro. When he got back to the Philippines, he sent me a letter. I, well, I should have kept it. Sent me a letter telling me how he was doing. And uh, so I, I got to be tight with him. And then Craig Trumbo. Of course, I was tight with him because of the stuff we were doing and whatnot. And I, I told you earlier, I went to uh, when I was a police officer. I went to graduate school at Fairleigh Dickinson, but I never stepped foot on Fairleigh Dickinson University. I went to a, uh, I went to Fort Monmouth. Well, being in Fort Monmouth, that again put me in contact with like military contacts. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to get a hold of uh, Craig Trumbo and track him down. So I, I was able to do it. I was getting closer and closer and closer. I make a call and uh, I get a fe fellow on the phone and I, I say, I'm trying to get a hold of uh, Craig Trumbo. They ask what my relationship is to him. I briefly tell him. And they said, uh, sir, I'm very sorry to tell you that he was killed a week ago in a car crash in his Corvette. Now here's a guy who survived oh, many tours of Vietnam. Right. You know, the greatest guy in the world. And a week before I actually tried to contact him, which is many years after, you know, it had to be, I went to graduate school in when, I, I can't even remember, I want to say 86. But a week before that, my call, he had uh, died in a, a car crash. So I never did get to speak with him. I have no pictures of him, which he, I regret. He had worked at Fort Monmouth? No, no, no. No, no, no. I was at Fort Monmouth going to graduate school, and that gave me the thought of using my military contacts there, and I was a police officer, to track him down. And I was in the process of tracking him down. I don't know where he was, really. It wasn't, it wasn't in New Jersey. I, I finally made a call, I was getting close to him, when the person I talked to on the phone said, right. I'm very sorry, sir, he died a week ago. And I, you know, I just stopped, but you know, I, I was the end of my search for trying to track him down because, yeah, we were very close, extremely close. So those are some of my quick stories. He's of, the reason that you had some of those opportunities in country. Oh, for sure. He's the reason. Yeah, because, well, this is a double-edged sword. Military people listen to this can appreciate what, I'm, what I mean. I'm going to shut this off. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. So, again, the military people will understand where I, what I mean by this. Here I'm out in another unit with a company commander who's in charge of me and other people who are in charge of me, and here comes Captain Trumbo onto the fire base, walking past everybody and just walking up to me, and we're getting on a helicopter and driving off. Now, <laughs> this is a double-edged sword because I'm sure there's a lot of people, nobody ever said anything to me, but I'm sure a lot of people above my rank didn't like it. But by the same token, they weren't really going to kind of mess with me too much because I must have some, some sort of contact somewhere that this could even happen. Uh, it never came up. It entered my mind many times. Like, oh man, this is uh, it's kind of good and it's kind of bad. Right. Um, it never developed any, any problem for me, but I was always cognizant of the fact that this might not uh, bode well people above my rank. Now again, due to circumstances, I was in a position where people come up and say, you can't be doing the stuff you're doing without at your rank of, of uh, E5. And that's when they put me in for E6. Now again, that, that never came through because I guess 
if you check what was going on then, the centralized promotion for my rank or whatever at that time never came through. If I stayed in the military, I'm confident it would have came through. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so my best friends, ironically, were Sergeant Teodoro and the Filipino. He was a major in outside of the uh, uh, Vietnam, I, I guess in the uh, reserves or something. I'm not really sure. But in any case, he was a first sergeant in in the uh, you know Vietnam. And Craig Trumbo, yeah, was just a good friend of mine, but a serious, real American hero type soldier, no question about it. <laughs> um, what else did I need? Mean? Oh, I got a million stories, but <laughs> those are those are that's basically my experience in Vietnam. All the people I met in Vietnam were outstanding. I never came across anybody I had anything bad to say about. Uh, kind of, sort of. I'm going to leave that part out, but. Um, yeah, for the most part, my military experience was, was good. Mm -hmm. The people I met were good. Um, I told you that one picture here, this sergeant, this, not sergeant, this uh, fellow here, the black uh, uh, soldier. What a great soldier this guy was. Really good. The real deal. His name was Wallace Johnson. I can't forget it, obviously. With his, uh, his first name was my last name, Wallace Johnson. He was about six, five, six, six. A real, a real figure of a soldier. This is him right here. Oh, okay. Again, his name is Wallace Johnson, and uh, just just a great, great soldier. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I had a lot of friends there. Um, and again, I knew I knew a lot of people because of my training. Mm -hmm. So my career, basically, I describe as uh, excellent. I mean, you're in the military. I don't care what branch of the military, you're going to get a hundred lifetimes of experience out of being in the military. Forget the combat aspect of the military. Just being in the military, I think, is a good experience for anybody. Um, I think you want to avoid any combat if you can. If you knew the outcome, it would be good. Like for my own sons, if they could have the experiences I had and come through it okay, yeah, for sure do it. But not knowing what could happen, uh, yeah, I would advise anybody to stay out of harm's way if they can. Mm -hmm. It's just common sense. It really is. So uh, people know, I mean, war is hell. There's no question it is. Uh, what will happen, you know, in a war zone, um, both sides are, are somewhat ruthless, and they get more and more ruthless. It's just part of the game. And I might note, by the way, which is true, I would many times pray that, <laughs> that God would forgive me for anybody that I would be in his position to have to kill, mm -hmm. but by the same token, I never had that prayer without also saying in that prayer, uh, asking for forgiveness for the enemy that might kill me. So that's a little touchy. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that's true. I, I mean, that's just the way I felt about it. And if you look at all the wars we had with brutal enemies, and, you know, Americans are brutal too, don't kid yourself. But you look at the Japanese, you look at the Germans, look at the Vietnamese, and years later, I mean, the people get along well, you know. And wars is, is a sad thing. It really is, because uh, people are people. Uh, all countries have really good people. It's evidenced by the fact that some of the worst wars we ever had, brutal enemies both ways. You know, the people are over here, they're marrying our people, you know, the Germans, the, all, all of them. You look at anybody we had war with. I mean, it's a serious war. I'm not talking about little skirmishes. I'm talking all out war. So, yeah, war, war, war is bad. And the best way to uh, eliminate war, in my opinion, every country should be mandatory that all citizens go through the VA hospitals in their country. It, it will shake you to the core. Mm -hmm. I, don't care who, I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Bill, I want to um, say before I film your shadow box that I'm honored and humbled that you're here today to speak to me of your sacrifice and contribution that you made in service to your country. Thank you. God bless you, and welcome home. <laughs> Thanks very much. Appreciate it. As you said, the um, airborne should be above the eagle. Well, yeah. What happened? My wife at the time surprised me with this. Brought it in some place who really didn't have much military knowledge. Uh, obviously, the airborne should go above the eagle. Mm -hmm. I never changed it. So I, I would change it except for it's. You see the back. It's pretty secure. Okay. And uh, again, these are not. Uh, these are just routine medals. There. Um, National uh, defense. Uh, national defense. Uh, combat infantryman's badge, of course. You're very um, proud of that one. Oh, for, oh, you better believe it. Right. Yeah, to be sure. 
Not you know, everyone gets that. No, that's true. You know, a very small percent of the population, uh, right. less than a half a percent of the population. Served, yeah. You know, some of my accomplishments, you know, you know expert, M16, expert, M14, expert, mortar, I think it is, I'm not sure. I, I had some other ones, but you know, those are ones I'm proud of. It, uh, that background uh, put me in good stead for my law enforcement career, which, I, by the way, I came right down here to the, to the uh, State Police Academy, we're located right here, as you know, in Seagart, mm -hmm. and I was a member of the 135th class, and uh, oh, right. I had a good career there. Matter of fact, I was the number one shooter in that class, the top shooter. I actually took the academic award, and that's how I started my police career, um, but it was my military career that made that possible. Was that right after you got home? I got home, and I was thinking to myself, well, what am I going to do? My father, who I tell you just served in the military, but he worked for a financial insurance company. He traveled to Newark every day by train. It's like a 12-hour day. I, I, you know, I was a college-educated individual at that time. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I never thought about police work for a second. But I said, i got to do something that's going to keep me close to home. I came down here to the state police uh, academy. I didn't know anybody. I walked into uh, the state police headquarters here. I talked to uh, Sergeant Cunningham. I still I didn't know him. I talked to him. I gave him my military history. And the next week, they sent me to the state police barracks in Howe as a communications operator. It's really a dispatcher, but the state police calls them communications operator. So I was now working for the state police, wait, waiting for a true class to come up. And again, it's like the government. Um, it could be a week, it could be years, nobody knows. I was there for 11 months at the state police headquarters waiting for a troop class. But while I was there, they started the Howe Township Police Department across the street. One man, Chief Morrell, Harvey Morrell, was a one-man police department when I was first there wow. with the intent of getting bigger. While I was still there waiting for a state police class to begin, they hired 15 experienced cops from different towns, Walt Township, Aberdeen, Madawan. While I was still there, they now ran a test for new officers which would be me, people with no police experience. I called my uh, brother-in-law at the time, Freddie Killian, who was a, uh, a Marine in Vietnam, and I said, let's go take this test for Hal. We took the test, and we were two of, I think there was like 400 people took the test back then, and two of us, myself and Fred, were two of the five, I think it was, hired in uh, 1972. That's when my police career started. Uh, so that worked out pretty good. There's all coincidence. Coincidence, I believe a lot of things that happen in life are fate. That was certainly fate because I didn't even hear of Howe Township. Even though it bordered Wall, you know, I, had, I had no reason to go to Howe Township ever. And the uh, first time I was there was I'm working for the state police. Um, although I think we did go out there uh, to get some uh, illegal beer when we were younger. There used to be a place called Lou's located at the end of uh, Atlantic Avenue and 524. 547. Did you have to be there. 21 to drink? Yeah, then you did, yeah. Yeah, wow. you did. So, uh, but I was, like I said, I wasn't really a big drinker, but we did do that. Oh, you said just that, to do right. It. Yeah, no, I, I was never a big drinker. Still, I'm not a big drinker. You know, socially, I'll have a beer with pizza or something. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I was never into the drugs or, or, or alcohol, oh, unfortunately. Oh, you lucky, yeah. Yeah, I was lucky, yeah, lucky, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that goes back to, uh, well, high school in those days, you know, if you were an athlete on any of the teams, you couldn't smoke. If you smoked, you'd be thrown off the team. That was a good thing. So therefore, I never even thought about uh, smoking. So, yeah. my wife and I graduated uh, Wall High School in 1964. That's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So, it's all good. How many she, I was a basketball player. She was a cheerleader, and uh, yeah. <laughs> you went through a lot together. Yeah. College, the war. Well, not with her because we we graduated high school together. But my first marriage wasn't to her. Her oh. first marriage wasn't to me. We actually hooked up. My mother and her mother were friends. Probably when I get married here, I'm going to get in trouble. But we've been married for 15 years. <laughs> oh, and, uh, So, uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's well, your precious. Your family, I'm sorry, I, I messed no, up. No, that's all right. No, that's fine. <laughs> you know, everybody has their history. And, uh, yeah, no, she's precious. And uh, we have the seven grandchildren together, which are priceless. Yeah. Oh. How many boys do you have? But myself, I have two boys. Um, she has, my wife Joyce has uh, two girls and a son. Her son is actually a lieutenant, studying right now to be a captain for the Walt Township Police Department. Uh, great, great kid. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty tight-knit group. Mm -hmm. 
to this day, like uh, I'll take my our grandchildren raised from age two to age ten. Oh, and uh, these kids are used to me. I'm very uh, hands-on with the kids. I'm very physical with the kids. Um, an example of that would be a brief example. When I take my, the last time I took my two grandchildren, two daughters, to, to Spring Lake Community Theater, beautiful theater right here. Uh, one was nine, one was eight. They're still sitting on my lap the entire performance at age nine and eight. You'd be like, well, how is this possible? But the reason is, these kids are used to, since the day they're born, just, you know, they'll be sitting on my lap, all of them, all seven will. If they're at my house, they will, if there's TVs on, they're gonna be sitting on my lap because I'm just close with them. And they're just used to, as babies, being that close to me. Very, very precious relationship I have with all the grandchildren. And again, you know, I, I'm used to throw them in the pool. Give, you know, I start with babies. I give them this little merry-go-round ride. That's where it starts, <laughs> with all of them. And uh, I, you know, I can't get them out of the house. So I started a family tradition of, when they're at the house, it's getting hard now because they're big and I'm not as strong as I used to be. Uh, I, to get them out of the house, I would go, okay, Poppy, they called me Poppy, I said, Poppy's going to fly into the car. And that's how we got them out of the house since they're babies. I would pick them up and I would say, well, you want to be a flying princess, the boys, maybe a flying alligator. I'd fly them out, spin them around, bring them through the trees and bring them into their car seat. So I still do it to this day. Um, but I'm due to stop that with the older girls because they're too heavy. Oh, you know, okay, yeah. you know, it's tough now, but yeah, I'm just giving you it. Inference of how tight I am with the, with the grandchildren. Like yeah. this, is, this has taken place their entire life. Another thing I do that's special, and I suggest to people watching this, I've done this for years, I have a little magic box. In the magic box, when any of the grandchildren come over, it's there right now, there's stuff in it right now, two of the grandchildren will, children will be there today. Um, whenever they come, which is frequent, I have something in that box. The girls, I'll have rings, or necklaces, or bracelets. The boys, I have little trucks. There's always something in that box for years. And uh, one of the boys questioned me recently. He said, Poppy, are you putting that stuff in the box? About a month ago. And I said, Evan. Oh, I said, Evan, do you think I have enough money to buy all that stuff that turns up in that box? And, that, and he was like, no, I guess not. And I dismissed it. <laughs> Eventually, I realized that Poppy had been putting stuff in that box um, for years. It's, it's still, to the, including today. Yeah. So that's just mm -hmm. things I like to do. It's a beautiful way to end the interview, speaking yeah, about your so. family. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're the best. Great job. Thank you.